Northern, U.S. Northern Command is currently hosting Exercise Arctic Edge 22 in Alaska, held every two years. This exercise consists of approximately 1,000 U.S. military personnel, and they're made up of uh, units from the Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, and Special Operations Command. Also included are elements from the Royal, Royal Canadian Navy, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and the Canadian Army. The goal of the exercise is to provide realistic and effective training for participants using the premier training locations that are available throughout Alaska. Arctic Edge 22 is linked to other service-specific exercises, including the National Guard's Arctic Eagle Patriot, uh, the Army's Joint Pacific Multinational Readiness Capability Exercise, and the Navy's ISEX. Uh, and those occur concurrently or consecutively uh, during the months of February and March of, of this year. With that, we'll take questions. Lita. John, can you give us a little bit more uh, detail on the so hotline, deconfliction line, whatever you want to call it, with Russia? Do you know if it has been used at all? Was it used specifically during the attack on the nuclear facility when one might think there might be some cause for concern? Um, and is it, would it be General Walters who would be sort of in charge or on the other end of the phone? Uh, can you give us a sense of who, who where, what this link is? And then just uh, secondly. You want the phone number too? Yeah, if you could actually put the phone here, it would be good. Um, and then um, just any, anything new on Odessa? <laughs> Um, on the deconfliction, I, I don't ha have any information about uh, whether it's been used. Uh, it's only been in, in uh, place for a, a couple of days. I think it's early this week. Um, it is basically a, a, a phone line, a phone connection to the Russian Ministry of Defense. It, it is being administered out of European Command headquarters. Um, and as as I understand it, it it's, uh, it's basically staffed by... Uh, you know, staff-level officers there at European Command. Um, uh, I have no expectation that, uh, unless he really desires, that uh, General Walters would, would be the one managing that. It's not at that level. It's at a, it's at a, a lower operational level. Um, and it's being um, administered as a bilateral U.S. to Russia deconfliction channel. So it's, uh, that, it, that's why it's... Uh, being handled out of U.S. European Command Headquarters and not General Walters under his NATO hat. Uh, but again, I, I refer you to UCOM to talk specifically about the whether and how it's it's been put in place. We know it we know it works uh, because we did establish it and set it up with the Russians. Uh, and when we tested it, uh, you know, they did pick up the other end and and acknowledged that uh, that they got the call. So so we know it works. Um, we think again that this is. As we've done before, like in Syria, uh, we think it's valuable to have a direct communication vehicle at that level, at an operational level, uh, to, to reduce the risks of, of miscalculation um, and to be able to communicate in, in real time if, if need be, particularly because now the airspace over Ukraine is contested uh, by, by both uh, Russian and, uh, and Ukrainian aircraft, uh, so that that contested airspace now buttresses right up against NATO. So, uh, smart thing to do, um, and uh, and we're glad it's in place. We're glad that the Russians have acknowledged that they will use it. Uh, on Odessa, I don't have an, an update for you. Uh, we haven't seen, and again, I have to caveat this by making clear our our visibility and our our detailed knowledge of of, of things that are going on on the ground is is ha has limits. Uh, but as of this morning, we hadn't seen any significant naval activity in the Black Sea that would lead us to believe that an assault on Odessa is imminent. That doesn't mean that that won't change over coming hours. It very well could. Um, as you've seen for yourselves, the Russian ground forces coming out of Crimea, arcing off to the northwest uh, through Kherson, uh, are now uh, beginning an assault on a town called Mykolaiv. Uh, that uh, town is not far from Odessa, just up the coast, a little bit to the northeast of Odessa. Uh, so uh, we, we don't know exactly what to make of that. We can't assert for sure that uh, the Russians are going to use a land route to, to assault Odessa, or even if they're going to move on Odessa. Uh, we're just uh, we're kind of watching this day by day, as, as you guys are. Just a quick follow-up on that. So since this is a bilateral sort of U.S.-Russia line, would then an instance like the nuclear plant not be an appropriate use of 
of the line. Of, it very of, well. It very well could be. Can I follow up on that question? Actually, I'm following up um, on that question. The nuclear line. Are you saying that it was not a nuclear line? Uh, excuse me. The deconfliction line. Are you saying it wasn't? I'm not um, saying it wasn't used. I don't. I don't have anything for you on on its physical use in the last couple of days. And what is the most senior a U.S. defense official who has spoken to their Russian counterpart since this uh, invasion has occurred? Uh, I, no, no, no leaders here at the Pentagon have. Uh, the General Milley has not spoken to uh, General Gerasimov since the invasion. Uh, Secretary Austin has not spoken to Minister Shoigu, his counterpart. Uh, since the invasion. Uh, I'm not aware of any other senior leaders here at the Department of Defense. Now, I can't speak for NATO. That's a, 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 a good question for, uh, for the alliance, but, uh, but I'm not aware of any senior U.S. military connections. And just separately on the bridge that was blown up um, near that convoy, uh, were U.S. weapons used to blow up that bridge, and, and what impact has it had on the convoy? I do not know what specific munitions were used uh, to uh, to thwart the convoy's advance. Uh, we do have reports that a bridge was was uh, was blown up that uh, we believe was in the path there. Uh, we also have indications that the Ukrainians have struck the convoy elsewhere and on their own uh, uh, on uh, on vehicles. But what munitions they're using, Jen? I, I just simply couldn't speak to that level of specificity. We do believe that that the actions by the Ukrainians have, in fact, stalled that convoy and certainly slowed it down, uh, stopped it in some places. Uh, but we also think that, uh, you know, that it, it's also a, of a piece of Russian challenges that they've had just in terms of their own physical ground movement, sustainment, logistics. They're running out of fuel. They're, we still believe that in, in some cases they're running out of food for their soldiers. So they've also been plagued by their own missteps and stumbles. Bobby. Thank you, John. So I have a couple of questions. On the uh, deconfliction uh, uh, mechanism, as, as you said, I mean, it's, it's helpful, especially now with the NATO airspace as close to the Ukrainian airspace. So why was it bilateral between the U.S. and Russia, not between Russia and NATO? I, I, I'm not uh, going to speak for the alliance, uh, Fadi. Um, and it's not like we are, we are a member of NATO. So certainly, um, uh, if, if we can use that deconfliction line to assist with the uh, with alliance communications, we'll absolutely do that. Um, I, I it's not so binary as that. I'm, all I'm trying to do is describe that it is set up bilaterally between the United States and Russia. I mean, I mean, but of uh, course, look, part of the reason that we that we want to do this is because of NATO airspace, which buttresses up now against uh, contested airspace. So it, it, you know, I. I if I conveyed any idea that you know we would only use this to convey U.S. individual unilateral concerns, that is absolutely not no, the case. I ask a question because a senior uh, defense official has said before that there are I ideas, uh, including maybe a NATO Russia channel. So was this, I mean, basically because Russia rejected such a channel and they insisted on? I, it? I don't have anything. Okay, there. and on uh, Zaporozhye, uh, what is what is the your understanding of what happened actually yesterday? And how, how safe is the uh, nuclear plant right now? We, we don't have uh, perfect knowledge of exactly how this attack on the nuclear power plant transpired. Um, clearly, there was one. Clearly, it was violent. Uh, uh, clearly, ordinance was, was used. Uh, an attack was, uh, was conducted uh, on the power plant um, in, a, in an effort by uh, Russian forces to gain control of it. We cannot contest or refute reports that they are, in fact, control of, in control of it. Uh, uh, and um, as for uh, conditions there, again, our knowledge is imperfect. But, uh, uh, but as we understand it, there's been no leakage of radioactive ma material. Now, the, what, what operational status it's in, we can't speak to. Our role here at the Department of Defense is to uh, continue to uh, assist the Department of Energy as they work through re response uh, efforts of their own uh, and, and as they work with allies and partners. You know, we, because we have experience running nuclear power plants uh, in the Department of Defense, uh, we're, a, we're, a part of that, we're a part of that effort providing some advice and, and counsel to the Department of Energy. Let me just take a moment, if I might, uh, though this is not your question, to uh, to, state, to state the obvious uh, about the dangers here and how this underscores the recklessness with which the Russians have been perpetrating 
this unprovoked invasion and assault on Ukraine and their sovereignty. Um, uh, attacking a nuclear power plant is e exceedingly dangerous uh, and uh, could have visited uh, a lot more damage and destruction to the people of Ukraine and to the uh, and, and perhaps even in, uh, to, to neighboring countries um, uh, ha had this gone a different way. Um, and we continue to call on Russia to stop the invasion, period, de-escalate, move their troops out, but certainly, short of that, uh, to be more mindful of their obligations uh, under international law and, and certainly with respect to uh, humanitarian concerns about, you know, uh, about perpetrating violence anywhere near a nuclear power plant, which are not designed to withstand combat. That's not, it's not their function, peaceful nuclear power. Oh, sorry, I wanted to just get that out in court. Do you have any indications that, um, that there's any disruptions to the power? I know one of the concerns is that if the, there's no cooling apparatus in the nuclear reactor, then that's, that's like a, a real um, vulnerability. Do you have any, I know that it's hard to say operationally, but do you have any indications of that? We, we don't, and uh, we don't know. Again, we don't know what the status of the plant is right now. Um, again, I'd point you to Department of Energy to talk about that with, with more detail. And then one, one thing, more thing on deconfliction. De I'm not clear, it, it's, it is, I get it, it's between the U.S. and the Russian military, but is there, uh, will there be a, a, some scenario where other NATO ally aircraft or, or military equipment could be, you could be deconflicting on their behalf? We haven't heard about any other nations setting up any kind of deconflictions, and others have been sending things forward to that area. Well, I so. think it's entirely possible that uh, should there be an alliance a concern that we can convey to the Russians through that channel, we absolutely will. Remember, we are also uh, a NATO ally. On the conflictional line, in Syria we know that uh, Russian and American uh, aircraft were crossing into their lines, and then of course they just were telling. Uh, say that part again. You know that Russian and like in, in, on Syrian airspace, Russian and uh, American air uh, assets were crossing into each other's line, uh, and that's why the the conflictional line uh, was used to say, "Hey, keep out of this area. We are climbing here, or oh, we are." going to strike this or we are here we are there but here in that this setting in this theater there are two separate air spaces and why like how does the confliction line is going to be used for what what will they say for example on the line because I, we don't see I, that I, I don't think there's like a given script that's going to be used on any particular day or in any particular instance I mean th this is uh, you, you got contested airspace over Ukraine which, which butchers, if, just let me finish, you get, which buttresses right up against countries, uh, NATO countries, uh, and their airspace. It makes eminent sense for us to be able to have some way uh, of, of communicating with the Russians should uh, operations uh, in that contested airspace um, uh, pose any kind of a threat or even just pose a concern to the alliance or to the United States. We want to be able to have a way of, of speaking directly at an operational level with the Russian Ministry of Defense. So it makes a lot of sense to do this. And, and also on, on uh, Black Sea, we now see that Russians have almost taken uh, one third of the entire uh, northern parts of the Black Sea, coast of the Black Sea. Is there a concern, or to what extent uh, concerning is it for you that Russians take the entire coast of the north uh, Northern Black Sea and just now, I, create a new I don't, geopolitical I don't, setting. I apparently don't have your level of visibility on where the Russian ships are in the Black Sea, and uh, I'm not prepared to cede or to uh, uh, or, or, or to say with certainty that, uh, that they have control over uh, the international waters in the Black Sea. They have naval assets in the Black Sea. They're a Black Sea nation. They have naval assets in the Black Sea. They have already used some of those naval assets to conduct an amphibious assault from the Sea of Azov uh, onto the, the coastline there uh, of southern Ukraine. As I've said to Lita, I, I don't have any updates for you in the maritime environment. I, don't, I can't assert for sure that they are planning to do yet another amphibious assault, whether it's towards Odessa or any other southern, uh, southern Ukrainian port, uh, but we're watching it as best we can. Okay, Jim. John, this is a little bit involved, but on February 18th, 
I asked uh, in Poland, I asked Secretary Austin if the national uh, defense strategy would need to be rewritten as a result of the Russian threats at that time. He said no, and that the integrated deterrence concept that underlaid the idea of the NDS was already sort of in use. I'd like to think, given the Russian performance in Ukraine so far, that it sort of cements the idea of China being the pacing threat. Uh, yet I'm seeing stories that uh, defense, national defense strategy is being rewritten. Has it changed since February 18th? Uh, what I would tell you, Jim, is that uh, the national defense strategy is, is, is still being crafted. It's going to be heavily informed by the president's interim national security guidance. Um, it's certainly being written in, uh, uh, in parallel with the national security strategy, which also hasn't been completed yet. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. The secretary was, was clear that uh, uh, it will reinforce his, his notion of an integrated deterrence. And it will certainly recognize that China remains the pacing challenge for the department. But it will also recognize other nation-state threats out there, um, uh, and, that, and that includes Russia. Um, and as we've been writing it, we've been writing it as we've watched Russia over the last couple of months, you know, build up this massive military force around Ukraine's borders. Um, so it would be foolish for us to think that, that the, the crafting of it wasn't also informed by what we've been seeing Russia do. Uh, but is it being rewritten? as a result of uh, what we're seeing Russia do. I think that overstates it uh, uh, heavily, uh, but it certainly will be informed by, uh, by what we've been seeing over the past couple of months. Yeah. Thanks. Tara. Tara. Thank you. Um, has the department seen any uh, evidence that the invading Russian force is also reliant on the internet and communications inside Ukraine? Um, there's been a lot of questions about why, you know, there was an assumption early on that the internet would be brought down, that the infrastructure grid would be brought down. Um, why is it that all of this infrastructure has remained in place, and are these forces also reliant on that to communicate and to navigate? Uh, I can't, um, I honestly can't speak to Russian plans here uh, and their intentions with respect to the information environment. Um, and as for their navigation skills again I I, I don't uh, I'm not riding in the cab of these trucks I don't know exactly what they're using to get from point A to point B clearly they're not getting to point A to point B very fast right now at least in the north um, so I can't speak to that Tara um, but we have seen some internet outages we have seen them uh, try to impact the information and communication environment not the least of which is striking uh, you know television towers and that kind of thing um, uh, and, uh, it, yeah, again, I, I don't want to speculate. I mean, they, perhaps they've, they have found some value to keeping some, uh, public communications open, uh, for their own purposes, um, uh, for their own decision-making processes, but that's just a speculation. I don't, I don't know. And then I have a, one follow-up on the deconfliction line. Um, if it's, if it's going to be used for, you know, deconflicting airspace, by uh, NATO borders, could it also potentially be used for, um, say, coordinating a humanitarian corridor or people fleeing Ukraine, or is it just going to be military to military operations? It's primarily a military to military channel, but that doesn't mean, as I've said before, that it, that, that it can't be used for uh, other purposes if need be. I mean, we'll have to see. It's only been a couple of days old, so um, we're, we're, uh, we, we think it's the right thing to do. It, we've, we've done this kind of thing before. Um, and it makes a lot of sense, particularly when you're talking about uh, that contested Ukrainian airspace. But could it find other purposes? Uh, perhaps. I mean, uh, we, we, again, we think it's the smart and the prudent thing to do. Barb. A couple of follow-ups uh, to other people's questions, but one question first. Can, can you bring us up to date on uh, the thinking about whether to support any moves by East European allies and partners to send their MiG-29s into Ukraine to give the Ukrainians extra inventory. You mean U.S. support to that? Do you support the idea? Is the United States, as you know, this conversation has ebbed and flowed 
over the last several days of several East European allies and partners, yeah. including Slovakia, which wants to accelerate its F-16 purchases so they can send their MiG-29s. Is this something, this idea, something that the U.S. would be supportive of? And then I have two quick follow -ups. I don't have a departmental position on this proposal, Barb. Uh, these are um, considerations that sovereign nation states have to make in, on, in their own and through their own processes. Uh, what I can just tell you is what, what we do support and what we are doing is looking for ways to continue to get security assistance into the hands of the Ukrainian armed forces, and we're, we're doing that to a fairly well, and we're uh, accelerating and expediting um, uh, the, even the most recent drawdown package that the President approved. And let me try one more time on deconfliction because, uh, so, I mean, you're, the United States is not entering Ukraine airspace or Ukraine territory. So you have nothing you need to uh, notify the Russians that you're doing because you're staying outside of this war zone. They, um, you said, you know, there was concern that there could be a situation in which you would have worries that would lead you to make a phone call. And you mentioned, in fact, the nuclear incident concern it was a case where you concerned that something could impact neighboring countries. So how, is there a way you can explain how much of this idea of needing to have a communications line with the Russians isn't really about deconfliction, because you're both supposedly staying on your own side, but worry that they may not stay on their side? I mean, it's primarily designed, uh, Barb, to, uh, to help reduce the risks of miscalculation. We, we call it a deconfliction uh, line, but um, b because that's what we're, we're, we're used to calling them, and that's what we typically use them for. But I, I, I'm not going to sit here, you know, only a, a few days after it's been set up and, and try to draw bright lines around what it could be used for. Um, if there's a need for us to be able to communicate with uh, the Ministry of Defense in a timely fashion about a concern, I suspect that we'll use it for that. And we would hope that the, the Russians, should they have a timely concern that they want to present, that they would use it as, as well. So when the nuclear incident happened, has it now led, uh, because you provide support to the Department of Energy, has it led to any additional need or consideration by the Defense Department for additional protective gear, sensors, or any kind of technology uh, for radiological or chemical or biological issues where U.S. troops are located and for the allied partners and nations and partners that they're working with. Did, did last night's events cause you to need to think about taking more protective measures? Because you said there was concern, the, the, one of the concerns could be the potential of okay. impact on neighboring countries. In general, striking a nuclear power plant would cause anybody to be concerned about, should cause anybody to be concerned about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to point you to the Department of Energy about uh, uh, whatever response um, coordination that they feel is appropriate. We provide some support and guidance to them. I have no decisions to talk to today about uh, any ad additional resources that, uh, that, that could, be, could be needed. Again, uh, again, without speaking for the Energy Department, uh, our assessment this morning is that there was no uh, radioactive leaks um, uh, and, uh, and no uh, significant damage to the plant's operation. But again, I, I really would uh, sure. I need to point you to the Energy Department for anything more specific than that. Well, for the protection of U.S. troops in the region, has this caused you, are there any discussions, thinking, analysis by this department for additional protection. Uh, I, know of no, I know of no such uh, decisions or uh, no such discussions with respect to what happened last night. Uh, but obviously we take force protection very seriously. It's the Secretary's prime and paramount concern. Nothing to speak to with respect to the, uh, the, the, uh, the attack on the power plant. Yeah, Matt. Thanks, John. Um, you said the airspace is still contested above Ukraine. That's right. You also talk about how on the ground effort in the north it seems stalled, more success in the south. 
I wonder if there's any parallels with that in the air. I know it's a, a changing environment, but are you seeing some regions in which either the Russians or the Ukrainians are more or less dominant in the air? You know, it's dynamic uh, airspace, uh, Matt. It would be foolish for me to try to carve it up for you at uh, two thirty in the afternoon on Friday and say that you know one one side or the other has more dominance uh, over a particular region because it's contested. That's what contested means. Um, all I can tell you uh, with certainty is that the Ukrainian air forces continue to fly. They still have air and missile defense available to them. They are using them. Uh, and using them quite effectively. And the way they have marshaled their resources and applied them uh, to the fight in the air has been quite extraordinary. The Russians likewise have a lot of aircraft available to them as well as uh, uh, missiles. They have fired over 500 since the beginning uh, of, this, uh, of this invasion. Uh, so that's what makes this airspace, uh, that's what makes it so contested, quite frankly. There's a lot of hardware flying around in that airspace, and it literally changes throughout a given day based on what the Russians are doing and how the Ukrainians are trying to resist what the Russians are doing. Um, and it's because it's so dynamic and so contested that, again, we felt it was important to have a deconfliction mechanism. Right. And one more, if I can, um, off of something Barbara asked. Um, at this point, a senior defense official earlier said that um, most of their the Ukrainian air capability is still intact. Um, are it, it, does it seem like that's a need, or are you aware of any requests of the Ukrainians for more aircraft? And if they already have most of their, their air power still um, intact, do they even have uh, extra pilots to fly any extra aircraft at this point? I don't want to speak for the Ukrainians. Uh, uh, what I can tell you is that we are in direct communication with them um, nearly every day uh, about their requirements, and, uh, and we're doing the best we can to fill those requirements. I think I'll just leave it at that. Jeff Selden, VOA. John, thanks very much for doing this. Uh, two questions. First, Ukraine's embassy in Washington is saying it has a list of about 3,000 American volunteers, including former military, who want to go and join the fight in Ukraine. Does the Pentagon have any position on Americans going to fight in Ukraine? And is there any broader effort to track foreign fighters of all nationalities? I, cer I certainly can't verify the, uh, the numbers that you've put up there. Uh, uh, we have seen no such list and, and no such, no such uh, compilation. I, I would just say this, and I talked about this, I think, a couple of days ago. F two things. One, this is not the place for Americans to be in Ukraine right now. Uh, and the State Department has made that very clear uh, in, in urging uh, over so many weeks for Americans that are in Ukraine to leave and urging Americans not in Ukraine not to go. It is a war zone. Now, that's number one. Number two, uh, should Americans want to help Ukraine? And it's, it's laudable that they do. The, the best way to do that is to find ways to contribute to the many uh, non-governmental uh, and humanitarian organizations that are trying to alleviate what has now become a, a very acute humanitarian crisis in Ukraine and in countries that are now bordering Ukraine, as what the UN just estimated, I think, yesterday, more than a million people have fled the country. And that doesn't even count the tens of thousands that are displaced in the country. So if you really want to help the people of Ukraine as a private citizen, find a way uh, to donate resources uh, uh, to uh, these, these organizations that are trying to alleviate that crisis. Tom. Along those lines, are there any prohibitions on uh, U.S. military personnel, let's say an Army reservist who wants to go over? I mean, Tom, I mean, the, the president's been clear there's not going to be any U.S. troops fighting in Ukraine. Well, uh, but the Army Reserve is volunteering to go over and fight with the Ukrainians. Are there prohibitions uh, under, under the law or DOD regulations about that? You know, I'm going to have to, I'm not a lawyer. I'm going to have to take that one, Tom. That, but let me be very clear. The president has made it clear U.S. troops are not going to be fighting in Ukraine. That includes in the skies over Ukraine. Uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is not a military mission that the United States military would take on. I know you're asking a very specific potential scenario. Let me find out rather than speculate and guess about that. Uh, Tom Squitary. Hey, thanks, John. Two quick questions. One, uh, last November, the Coast Guard finished the transfer of three ships to the Ukrainian Navy. I'm wondering if the Pentagon has visibility on their status. And the second question is um, a senior uh, 
official yesterday talked about how at least 70 missiles were fired from Belarus into Ukraine. Is it the Pentagon's analysis that that uh, places Belarus as a, uh, a participant in the war? Thank you. Uh, what we've said all along, Tom, is that uh, uh, Belarus uh, is partly responsible for what's going on in Ukraine. We've been, we've been very clear about that by the support that they have given to Russia to be able to launch this invasion. Now, we haven't seen Belarusian forces insert themselves into Ukraine. We haven't seen indications that they are preparing to do that. But clearly, they are complicit uh, with President Putin's war of choice, no doubt about that. And as for the ships, Tom, I, I don't have any update for you on that. I, I, I just simply don't know. Jeff Shogel. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It appears there's been some news during the news conference here. Uh, I'm reading something that says the Moldavian, Moldovian breakaway region of uh, Transnistria, which I'm not pronouncing correctly, uh, has demanded that Moldova recognize its independence. This is a place where about 1,500 uh, Russian troops are stationed. Is the Defense Department concerned that this could be an expansion of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? I got nothing for you on that, pal. I haven't seen this report, and I'm not going to uh, try to wing it here from the podium on something that you're seeing online. So uh, uh, we'll check and, and, and see if we have anything on it. But I, I, I'm not going to take the question because uh, I believe that that's probably a better question put to my State Department colleagues. However, I'll, I'll go see uh, what's available out there. But I'm, I'm just not capable of, uh, of jumping into something that's breaking, breaking right now. Tony Capascio? Hi. I John, I have a budget question, uh, nine Ukraine specific, but what is the status of the FY23 budget? Are the final numbers pretty much done and you're kind of feeding it into the computer and ready, ready for release? And has the invasion at all changed the, nego changed the number? Has there been a major influx of funding in the last, couple, in the last week because of the invasion? I'm sure it's going to shock you, Tony, but I'm not going to talk about the status of the FY23 budget. We're still hard at work at that, uh, that effort being led by the Deputy Secretary. Uh, she's, uh, she's running a, a very tight process, and I am not going to get ahead of that process and how that's going, but we're, we're working on that real hard. Uh, Idris. Hey, Tony, you have a follow-up, or do you want me to go? Yeah. Does the, does the national security strategy and the national defense strategy have to be published first before the budget comes out. Is is that the sequence? Uh, they don't have to be, Tony. Um, th there's no uh, there's no regulation. There's no rule. There's no legislation that requires you have to have the national security strategy and the national defense strategy published before uh, before the budget. All three documents uh, inform each other. Um, uh, look, ideally. Uh, you want a budget to follow a, a strategy, but it doesn't have to come out that way. Idris? Thanks, Idris. Yeah. Um, just going back to the hotline, when you're setting it up, how does it work? Does General Walters talk to his counterpart saying, all right, we're going to set this up, and then some of the staff set it up? Um, at what level does it rise, I guess? And second question is, any change to the nuclear forces, uh, Russian nuclear forces, after they were put on high alert? I have no uh, no changes to speak to that we've noticed in uh, the Russian strategic uh, nuclear force posture. Uh, we're still uh, obviously monitoring and reviewing uh, as we do every day. Uh, I would just again say that Secretary Austin is com comfortable and confident in our own strategic deterrent posture and our ability to defend the homeland as well as allies and partners. And uh, it's not a hotline. It's a deconfliction line. Uh, as I said, it's, it's handled and staffed at the operational level. Uh, I don't think there's any expectation that General Walters is going to be the only one uh, picking up the phone. Certainly, if he wanted to do that, as European Command Commander, he could do that. Uh, but our anticipation is that this will be uh, staffed at a lower level uh, on his headquarters uh, to really deal with, with operational level concerns that, uh, that need to be expressed. Okay, one more, and then I'm going to go. The um, daily update on number of uh, munitions fired, and also if you have a breakdown of, you know, where you're seeing them come from. Uh, I don't have that, and I wouldn't be putting that out here from the podium, Tara. Uh, as I said, uh, we have noticed uh, we not noticed we we've assessed that since the beginning of this invasion, the Russians have fired more than 500 missiles of various types, cruise missiles, 
short-range ballistic missiles, medium-range ballistic missiles, surface-to-air missiles, more than 500 of them. Um, uh, that, that, that's about as much detail as, as I'm going to be able to go into from the podium. Yeah, in the back there. Yeah, I know you've talked about fuel and uh, food shortages today that the Russians have faced. I was curious if they're making any progress overcoming that or if it's still largely stalled and then what the concern is that the Russians may <coughs> to get other nuclear plants in the future given this is the second one we've seen here. Uh, again, we don't have perfect visibility into Russian intentions. We know there are other nuclear power plants inside Ukraine. Clearly, uh, the international community does not want to see another incident such as what we saw last night, um, which could potentially just escalate the level of violence and destruction in Ukraine uh, to a level that, uh, uh, that, that is and should be unacceptable, even to the Russians. But I can't speak to their intentions with respect to other uh, nuclear power plants. Um, and as for food, food and fuel, again, our general assessment today is that they are still struggling with logistics challenges to include food for their troops and fuel for their, uh, for their vehicles. We do not believe they have overcome that. Now, uh, as I've said many times, we would expect them to try to overcome these challenges, and, and uh, I think we're seeing uh, attempts by them to do that. How successful they've been, again, with a, a level of specificity, we just don't, we just don't know. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a good weekend.